All right. Sorry about that, everyone. Um, and then the last thing we'll have room for is questions and discussion. Next slide. Great, so the context and opportunity for this work originates in a grant that the city of Seattle received in um, 2020 from the Federal Transit Administration to address equitable transit oriented development along the West Seattle Ballard link extension by centering community leadership and addressing station access, remnant parcels and equitable development outcomes. While this work is focused along the West Seattle Ballard link extension alignment, we hope to develop a framework that applies citywide. The outcome of this work will be an equitable TOD implementation plan with implications for station area planning and future community investments. Another critical outcome of this work is the process itself, um, which we've laid out in the RFP and was actually co-developed with a group of core community stakeholders. There are three participant groups, the community advisory group who will comprise the main decision makers um, and question asking um, through an iterative facilitated process the technical advisory group with issue area expertise and access to decision making and policy spaces on ETOD will support issue area trainings, research tasks and facilitation as needed. And then parallel to an integrated with this alignment wide and citywide process are ongoing conversations in Delridge, Chinatown International District and Westlake to employ neighborhood and community specific tools and strategies where there are heightened displacement risks. Um, the consultant will help recruit and convene the community advisory group and will facilitate the development of an ETOD implementation plan with the community advisory group and support from the technical advisory group and staff. The proposed process um, will run from the recruitment phase beginning as soon as the consultant is selected. Once the community advisory group, technical advisory group and place based groups are recruited, we will kick off with a healing and trust building retreat to onboard and level set with participants. The core work program component will refine the existing draft values, visions, and definition of ETOD that are in uh, the um, a PDF that's linked in the RFP itself and identify the strategy elements and tactics um, and prioritize those bodies of work for further exploration in the implementation phase, um, which will run through 2024 and we'll come back together to piece everything together. Andrew. Yeah. Thank you, Julia. Um, to clarify uh, how the consultant fits into this body of work, um, the, staff, the consultant will be working fairly closely with staff and to um, advance the work that has already been done, as Julia mentioned. But specifically, the next phases of this body of work include um, the recruitment, selection, and onboarding for a community advisory group, which is the foundational aspect of this work. Um, this work will be driven by the advisory group itself. And then the second part of this body of work will also include uh, a structure for how the advisory group will function. Um, and that is really about like creating the container and the design of the group itself, uh, the structure, and then facilitating that proposed structure and process um, as it relates to the development of an ETOD strategy and implementation plan. Um, here it talks about uh, support from a technical advisory group um, and I just want to underscore that here that this part is still under development and there's possibility that a technical advisory group is not a body in itself to that will be convened a formal body that convened but it might be 
a group of technical uh, stakeholders with technical expertise that will be part of the community advisory group to advise as needed. Um, I'll, this next part, I'll get into a little bit more detail about the project scope. Um, so as I mentioned in the last slide, uh, there's really two main bodies of work as part of the scope for this uh, RFP. And again, it's the, the first part is uh, we need to stand up a community advisory group, and we also have to create um, the container and process for how the group operates. Um, and this first part particularly includes designing a process of which we can actually uh, bring on and recruit advisory groups. And then the second part again is the facilitation of the groups them of the group themselves. Um, I want to oh go back, Julia, real quick. Um, what you see here on the right side is uh, the ETOD summary document that is mentioned in the RFP. Um, some consultants have notified us that they weren't able to access the the first version of the RFP, this particular document. Um, so we have provided an addendum to the RFP that provides a link to this. Um, and this is a foundational uh, body of work and document, summary document, reference document that is critical in responding to this RFP. So I would encourage all of you who are planning to submit a response um, to look at this document. Uh, it is the body of work that is summarized um, by, uh, Julie had referred to this, uh, body of work that was developed by a smaller group of stakeholders. Next slide. Um, so I'll go a little bit more detail of the first part. As I mentioned, um, this scope of work uh, is described in RFP under section five, page four. Um, and essentially we want to kick off a process. Oh, I'm just hearing some echo. Uh, we want to kick off the process uh, with an internal alignment with city staff. So what that is designed for is uh, we know when these scopes are developed, um, there's still an alignment process that has to go through with the with city staff and other stakeholders within the city. Uh, and we want to create an actual intentional process to tease out any questions um, so that the scope uh, is manageable and there's clarity on that at the beginning. And particularly with a process that is fairly community driven, we want to make sure that there's understanding and alignment there. Um, so that would be a core body of work um, as we kick off. And it will also start with um, the uh, consultant proposing a recruitment approach. Um, and what that means is uh, understanding who we, we really want to target. Um, so we have that described already in the RFP and in the summary document, and then creating a, a specific process to uh, solicit the opportunity as well as recruit the members that we are targeting. Um, the consultant will also be responsible for managing the selection of the community advisory group. So that means anything from um, setting up uh, a review committee, um, organizing applications, if an application process um, is what the consultant recommends, there might be another process for um, potential CAG members um, to uh, express their interest in, the, in being part of the CAG itself. Um, and as you see below, there's a timeline. Um, so this body of work is really um, organized by kind of three separate parts. There's like the onboarding of the community advisory group, and then there's a core work program of the advisory group itself. Um, and then there's an the implementation, which also includes a, a core, uh, an overlap of the core work program. So we'll go into that a little bit in the next phase, uh, in the next part B. Um, part B, once we have a community advisory group, we want to kick off um, the process with the group themselves through what we call a healing trust building uh, component that is scheduled uh, to start on quarter three of 2023. And 
And based on the timeline that I've mentioned, I also want to underscore that in the RFP, it mentions that this project um, is related to, uh, for those of you who are, who are familiar with, uh, in Seattle, there is um, the West Seattle Ballard Link Extensions body of work, which this uh, body of work is related to, um, but it is also a little bit separate from that. And so because it is related to the West Seattle Ballard Link Extension body of work, that timeline uh, is very dynamic. And so there's an expectation that this timeline in itself is also dynamic and may shift to capture what happens with that other process. Um, but going back to this specific process, the healing and trust building component is really about um, starting the process with uh, all the community advisory group members on the same page, uh, being for them to understand uh, the historical context of disinvestment and institutional racism. And there's an opportunity for them to build trust amongst themselves and a shared understanding of their role and how their role will contribute to the development of the ETOD strategy and implementation plan. Um, in the section second component that you see refined foundational work, um, that's really around, um, it's, it's designed to be a learning component, a co-learning component where we go through the historical context of why uh, equitable transit oriented development is important, uh, particularly in this region and in Seattle. Um, some of that might be covered in the healing and trust building component. Um, so there might be some overlaps. Uh, and there's also intended to be some learning around how ETOD has, uh, how has been done and what opportunities there are for doing this work in Seattle's context, in the context of the West Seattle Link Extension. Um, we'll also go over the ETRD vision values that was previously developed by the smaller stakeholder holder group, um, but the outcome of that is to refine that element and to have a, a final version of the vision and values. The third component you see starting in quarter one, 2024, establishing the strategy and work groups, that's really just um, identifying what the strategies could be uh, for the ETOD strategy and implementation plan at a very high level and identifying the tactics that we will actually develop more thoroughly in the implementation plan. So you see that that component is um, just one quarter and the subsequent component implementation plan is actually where um, the development of the tactics and more thoroughly the strategies will be done. Um, our next slide. Here I want to give folks an overarching uh, summary of the timeline for the RFP itself. So you can see what's highlighted in gray is where we're at today. The next major milestone is going to be next week is the deadline for submitting any questions that we will then uh, post responses to within a few days, hopefully by the end of that week. Um, so March 8th, that is next Wednesday. And the response deadline is March 17th. Um, two Fridays from tomorrow, and we are scheduled to have interviews on the 29th. Um, I do want to note on the RFP, and I should have put it on here, the deadline for uh, the response to deadline is actually uh, basically 11.59 on uh, p.m. on the 17th, and uh, I think the deadline for questions we listed as uh, 2 p.m. that day, uh, March 8th. Here I want to get into more specificity on the qualifications and experience. So what you see on the left side is the minimum qualifications that's described um, in the RFP. And this is really about just uh, seeking firms with experience in facilitation, particularly as it relates to planning policy, community development uh, areas. And then also experience working with community organizations and populations at high risk of displacement. Uh, also experience designing, facilitating advisory groups or leadership development processes. 
Uh, and that's specifically related to the areas of uh, experience listed in the first bullet. Um, this, this is different than what is noted in the proposal response, uh, section 8.6B, that's the relevant project experience section. Um, and we're asking uh, firms to describe their experience with building community relationships and practicing relational culture um, because this is a community driven process, particularly with BIPOC community and communities who have uh, experienced uh, displacement. Uh, this is the approach that we're hoping organizations can provide uh, their expertise and experience and suggestions on what this could look like. And we're also asking for experience um, facilitating development, particularly as it relates to equal development uh, and equal planning policy outcomes, again, with BIPOC communities. Um, and how this third bullet is different is um, we're asking uh, organizations to describe in more detail their experience in leadership development and community building, particularly as it relates to facilitation of community centered processes. And here I want to uh, talk a little bit more about the proposal response questions. Um, we have three questions that we're asking organizations um, to respond to, and the first is really wanting to um, really wanting to understand the different uh, models, the decision making models that organizations have used uh, because there's going to be a large diversity of stakeholders involved. Um, we want to be able to understand uh, the different tools that people can use depending on who their stakeholders are. So of course, there's different models that you all might have used consensus building to consent, um, but we really want to understand how you could deploy that in this context. Second question is around um, why this is particularly important is we are anticipating having community advisory group members who uh, don't have technical expertise, but lived experience expertise. Um, and so having experience being able to facilitate a process where you're bringing in complex technical planning and policy um, to community members who don't have that background, but then uh, conversely being able to understand the lived experience of the stakeholders who are involved, the community advisory group, and being able to somehow communicate and facilitate that discussion in the context of the technical planning and policy topics and to people who have the expertise. So it's kind of a two way communication and facilitation. Um, the third proposal question is around um, describing your experience with centering racial equity and restorative practices, uh, particularly as it relates to facil facilitation of people who have experienced uh, institutional racism uh, and then how you would center the live experience of BIPOC community members. So you see that based on the um, last two slides I described, um, the points for the scoring criteria reflects that. Um, so under the project understanding and approach, we're putting the most points at 40. And for the three proposal response questions, we're putting it in at 25. Um, so combined at 65, which is the majority of the points. Um, and that's really where we want to see um, organizations uh, kind of prioritize uh, their responses and being able to help us understand um, how they could craft an approach based on what we have proposed. Next slide. Um, before I open it up for questions, I just wanted to uh, do a quick um, summary of the addendum that we've posted so far based on the questions that we have received. Um, so again, I want to call attention to the key reference document that is provided in the addendum. That's the ETOD summary document um, that describes the body of work done by a smaller group of stakeholders to help us understand how to develop this process. Um, the procurement schedule deadlines, we've added uh, not only just the dates, but the time to both the 
deadlines for questions and the deadline for the submission of the proposal itself. Um, we received a question about the budget range and the compensation for community advisory group. The budget range is 75,000 to 100,000. And the reason why we did that is we wanted to make this um, opportunity open to a range of organizations. Um, maybe it's a team of two, maybe it's a larger firm uh, with other um, staff who might be part of the process and that uh, scale of the budget reflects um, the flexibility of who we're looking for. In terms of the CAG compensation, that is not part of the consultant's 75 to $100,000 budget. Um, the city has its own budget designated for that, uh, and we're still finalizing um, the compensation rate for that. Um, the consultant scope timeline, there was a question on uh, why the body of main bodies of work was ending in quarter two of 2024, but that we're asking consultants to do work through 2024. And the answer to that is because, again, um, this is a dynamic project. Uh, and so we're building in some cushion, but at the same time, uh, another key reason is that we want, um, we've gone through some of these processes uh, before, particularly with a smaller stakeholder group. And what we learned is like, once their work was done, we actually had additional questions and issues for them to clarify. Um, and so we want to actually create uh, more time to re-engage the CAG if we wanted to clarify anything in, as we go through implementation as a city. And I will open it up for questions. Um, if you can, you can ask questions in two ways. If you want to enter into the chat, and I'll, I'll answer them as they come in, um, or if you can use the raise your hand function, um, at the very top, there's a raise hand function if you want to do that. Any questions? I'm not hearing, but are there any questions? That means we did a very good job explaining. <laughs> <laughs> comments, I guess. No comments or questions. Um, are there folks who are planning on typing in their question? If so, you could probably just uh, speak up. Quiet group. <laughs> uh, well, um, I guess I'll make a last call for questions and clarifications. Otherwise, oh, I see Nicole typing. Nicole, do you have a question? Yeah, I was just wondering why this is a consultant role and not a staff role. That is a very good question. Um, there's a few responses to that. Um, the reason for that is um, capacity. Um, we want staff to be able to focus on doing the support uh, throughout the process. So that means um, what you might gather is that uh, a lot of the curriculum development through the different modules of work uh, staff will be uh, developing that uh, in real time because this is a process that is really responding to the community advisory group we have planned curriculum uh, but we're kind of crafting that depending on what the group where the group is going to take us and so we're putting staff capacity towards being able to do research, all the logistics, um, 
we actually have, as Julia mentioned, the place-based groups. So work in the Chinatown International District as well as Del Ridge staff is actually um, providing support to those groups. And so our staff capacity is going through that. Um, and we really want a facilitator to be able to um, not be stuck in the weeds of um, all the different logistics and curriculum development, but being able to bring in their skill of just facilitating the topics and facilitating um, the expertise of the uh, community advisory group. Does that answer your question? We also, if I could add, Andrew yeah. had a um, explicit ask from the um, stakeholders we engaged with last year who helped co-develop the um, summary document that an kind of independent facilitator could help uh, you know, support like support transparency and trust building um among the participants better than staff um than staff could where there's you know distrust of the institution um facilitating this process. Yeah, and to reiterate uh, Julia's point, um, we know that we're asking community members to be part of a process uh, with an institute. So, you know, we're talking about institutional racism as part of this process, and we the, ourselves are the institution. Um, and so we want to be able to create a process where um, the community members and community advisory group are engaging with a facilitator that is not city staff. Uh, Mallory, go ahead. Hi, I'm wondering um, if you can share anything about the history of that institution community relationship that might give us good grounding for developing um, our own kind of strategic approach in a proposal. Um, just so I understand your question, you're asking us to just give a quick summary of how the institution um, has one been involved in causing harm and the institutional racism um, that this process is addressing. Is that your question? Uh, yes, that and um, a really brief sense of what has engagement looked like around that issue, like up gotcha. until now. Um, I'll probably have Julia talk a little bit about um, the experience of, you know, communities with institutional racism as it relates to this. Um, and then I can answer the question around the history of the work because um, Julia's experience actually on the outside. Do you mean with the initial sound transit investment, Andrew? Um. I think maybe just in general um, invest. Yeah, I guess that would be in this case, some transit investment. Yeah, I mean, can, it, can I just clarify what, specifically what I, I was looking for is trying to understand how might the community members think about the institution that, you know, the consultant would be asking them to engage with. That's kind of what I'm getting at. Sure. Um. I mean, I think in general, and I think we like list out more explicitly the history of like racism in like government perpetuated racism <laughs> um, and harm like historically in the summary document. Um, and we have like a timeline there, um, but I think the the like, you know, regional transit investments in our in in rail, I'll say for our region are relatively um, you know our our light rail system first came online in two thousand and nine. so it's kind of like a newer issue and um, you know, but infrastructure projects are not new. <laughs> like infrastructure investments are not new. And so the communities who will be um, facing these investments, um, you know, particularly Chinatown International District um, Del and Delridge neighborhoods have seen kind of the harm of 
large infrastructure investments, um, you know, both like completely separating and splitting apart neighborhoods, um, kind of construction disruptions, displacement of um, core institutions, residents and small businesses. Um, and um, and it's on it's ongoing. <laughs> so I think the but you know it's both the city of Seattle and Sound Transit as the regional transportation authority. Um, but I you know there's also been like collaborate like collaboration. It's not all like we don't you know it's not not all distrust. <laughs> um, if that helps answer your question. Andrew, I don't know if you want to add anything. Yeah, I can add a little bit. Um, you'll notice in the ETOD summary that we referenced the equi Equitable Development Initiative. Um, so that is a program within the Office Planning Community Development of which both Julie and I are staff members of. And uh, that initiative actually has its roots in community advocating for. And I won't go into the history too much, uh, but essentially, through that program, we actually are engaging with community members quite actively um, through the funding of and working towards community ownership of land. Um, and in terms of your question towards the history of engagement, um, that's the lens of which we are approaching this work and the engagement also is that there are pathways and there are efforts of the city of Seattle um, and we're we're not saying like we are community and government has to um, play a pretty fine like dance on a fine line of community power building. So we're creating the opportunity for that, um, and we're funding actual uh, place based work um, as we've already mentioned. And so the in terms of the engagement, it's providing the opportunity for things that. Uh, community have already asked through other efforts um, as it relates to uh, equitable development. And this is work that is specifically equitable development, but it is within the context of light rail investment and high displacement risk areas because of that investment. Um, ah. Uh, so Nicole's question is, are we certain who should be on there? Um, and are we hoping for investment in new leadership? So the question is, uh, the guidance that we received from the smaller uh, steering group, uh, smaller stakeholder group, is that they wanted to see a process that centers uh, new voices and voices that aren't particularly, uh, as you know, the term that you use, they do not want to see more usual suspects. Um, and so as we are doing this, I think we're balancing a little bit uh, between um, who we're able to recruit. Uh, a lot of times we are, so we are compensating um, participation. So we're hoping that that gets through the barrier. A lot of times we have usual suspects because they are paid for by the organizations that they're associated with. Um, but they also said they didn't want to see like executive directors of organizations, but we might balance between like depending on who it is um, and their uh, role and experience. Um, but we are as the language you use. Yes, we are hoping to invest in new leadership into this body of work. Uh, and that is, um, and, and to extend a little bit more to your question, that is what we're asking uh, the consultant to do is to help us develop a process where we could recruit uh, new voices. Mallory, do you have additional questions or that's just a residual from your first question? No, I, I didn't realize my hand's still up. I'm putting it down. <laughs> no worries. Um, all right, any other further questions? Right. Well, if there are no other further questions, uh, we're actually very excited and hoping that all of you will submit a response. Uh, and reminder, the deadline is March 17th 
uh, that's a few weeks, that's about two weeks from tomorrow. Uh, and that will be the end of day 1159 Pacific Standard Time. And you are welcome to send me any additional questions, uh, but please note there is a deadline um, for that. The deadline is for questions is uh, on the 8th, March 8th. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for your time. And I look forward, we look forward to reading your responses. Thank you. Bye.